Our next speaker this evening is Reverend Paul Vanderclay. He's a Christian Reformed Church pastor from Sacramento, California. And I'm really excited that he's here because I watch all his videos. <laughs> um, well, I'm excited about everybody, but. He's known for engagement with others through conversation regarding the meaning crisis. Paul is um, an excellent addition to this conversation because he's known for his engagement with others through conversation regarding the meaning crisis. Paul manages to speak both with academics with curiosity, synthesizing and summarizing their work well, and engaging them meaningfully while also engaging with those outside of the academy as they grapple with the meaning crisis in their own lives. So Paul brings a uh, wealth of experience and a real ability to track and to, to bring others forward in a conversation and to, to help people bring their own thoughts forward as well. Um, and he has a, a lot of history just uh, uh, surveying the riches of philosophy and theology within the church and also keeps a close tag, tag on uh, current culture and current thought. So I'm very happy to have Paul here. So, so usually when I'm commenting on this little corner of the internet, I'm doing it from my little corner of the office. And I, and I get to watch a John Verveke lecture in advance, and I get to think about it, and I get to go over it a few times and, and figure it out. Now, now Burke, um, where's Burke? Are you here, Burke? Burke Wilson? Where is he? Did he have to go to bed? Getting coffee? This is a big moment. Because, you know, I was going to live stream this thing with Rick, and so I'm setting up a camera, it didn't work, so no live stream, sorry. But he says, are you going to wing it? I said, no, I'm not going to wing it, I'm very well prepared. And then John's talking, I'm thinking, oh man, I'm going to have to wing it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm only going to half wing it. I'm going to start in the middle. And, well, let's see. So I, I brought, Scotland went out and got me a clicker, which I really like. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I, the, this slide is important because I'm not going to talk about zombies. I, I had zombies in a previous iteration, but I decided to go with sleepwalking because that was a metaphor I used in Europe about this question of consciousness. Now, I'm kind of coming at this from a different place because I'm not a scientist, I'm a pastor. And I bump into this question of consciousness in the lives of people. And actually, some of the people right here, right when they were talking, and they are saying, like, well, what about this, and what about this, and what about this? I'm like, I don't know. Where's Burke? I'm going to wing it. But as a pastor, this question of consciousness gets boiled down to some interesting things, like the question, does Google read your email? What do you think? Does Google read your email? And, and right away you have to ask the question, well, what do you mean by that? Well, if I say that there are computers that are scanning all of your emails looking for ideas about what you may buy so that they can throw advertising at you, you might say, eh, yeah, okay. But if I say there's someone in a little room that's scrolling through your email, a real live human being, a person, and then suddenly say, no, no, that's wrong. I don't want a person reading my email. Well, why not? Well, because what if I bump into this person? And, and Google probably doesn't care if I'm having a really nasty interchange with my mother via email, but this person will pay attention to that and what if I meet this person? This question of consciousness is, um, let's go a couple more. Because I want to, oops, wrong button. I need to get a new clicker. 
I, I want to bring Verizon in. Anybody remember Verizon Lisa? Raise your hand if you remember Verizon Lisa. Okay. Verizon Lisa was a very early addition to my videos. This was actually before iPhones. Verizon had a commercial where Lisa is walking around having a conversation with the universe. And she walks by a Verizon store. And oh, the universe is telling me I need a new cell phone. And, and also, my hair looks good. So thank you, universe, and she gets a Verizon cell phone. One of the big issues I have with the question of consciousness and people's lives is similar to this Google question of, is there someone, and that whole question of a someone, is there someone out there that is watching me, is paying attention to me, that I can relate to? You know, the question of, Google's computers, algorithms, reading your email, well, there's some relevance realization in there because, well, that, sort of that AI is looking for, can I sell this person an iPhone? But that's not quite what we're thinking about when we think about consciousness. So a lot of people, oh, wrong button. When it, when it comes to consciousness and pastoring, and I think also when it comes to the meaning crisis, we have this real question of can post-enlightenment buffered self individuals make sense of relating to a personal God or someone like an employee of Google who's reading through the emails versus a machine, a God who hears prayer, a God who cares, a God who acts. These are all the questions that people bring to me when a nephew gets sick and the church prays and he dies. What is, in, what is exactly the nature of consciousness and does it make any difference at all whether this center of consciousness that I experience myself to be is more like the Google computer or this person in San Jose reading my fight with my mother. Now, see, I got, I got two things going here. So, one of the things that struck me, and we can talk about this when we get here, is at what level are we talking about this word consciousness? And I am not a cognitive scientist. I am a pastor, and as a pastor, what I tend to do is pay careful attention to the words people use, both with me and sort of in culture, because there seems to be sort of relational consciousness below us and relational consciousness above us. And part of this little conversation that John and Jonathan and I have been having has been what exactly qualifies, and how does that, in fact, change our lives in terms of who we are and how we behave? And so another very old thing on my channel that I haven't done for a while is words that fudge, and this one is consciousness. Because as I could really see from John's, there's a lot of fudginess out there in, in consciousness out in the academic community, and they're trying to work this out. Now, what do I mean by fudge? Does everybody know what I mean by fudge? You all had high school chemistry, and you knew the result you were supposed to get, and you knew the result you got, and the math didn't work right, so you just kind of fudged to bring the two things together. Now, consciousness is a word that almost everybody uses. A lot. In fact, there's an accident. You call up the phone. Is he awake? Is he conscious? What are you asking? Are his eyes open? Is he moving? Is he responding? What if you're calling about your dog that got hit and not your uncle? Well, probably you'll ask him the same question. Should we use this same word 
for your uncle and your dog. Now, I, I should have watched John's conversations with Greg. I'm realizing that now. But instead, I decided to go to the true authority in the modern world, which is a TED Talk. Because what people tell me is, you know, I, I really wish church was more like, like some pictures and a TED Talk. Isn't that what, do you think church should be like, Jonathan? A TED Talk? Because <laughs> TED, TED Ed is the authority. And so I thought, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to put in the question, what is consciousness? And the number one ranking that came up was a TED Talk answering the question. And right away, it got very fudgy. So, so they talked about this woman who had had a stroke, and she had, you know, certain, certain part of her brain on one side was disabled, and so they did all kinds of tests with her, and so they showed her, they had two pictures of an identical house, one with flames and one without. And they asked her, is there any difference between these houses? No. There's no difference between these houses. She couldn't see any difference between these houses. That's the thinky-talky part. And then they asked her, what sort of house would you like to live in? And she pointed to the one that wasn't on fire. Well, that's interesting. So, so right away, I mean, John had those five words. And one of them was awareness. I took good notes, so maybe I'll have to do a commentary on John's talk later. But I can't do that right now. But, but so you have this question of awareness. But the more I thought about this and worked through this, I thought this very much has a lot to do with John's relevance realization. Because when, asked, when the woman asked, which house would you live in, she kept picking the house that wasn't on fire. Yet, if you asked her, is there any difference in the house? She'd say no. But another level of her knew that there was a difference, even though the thinky-talky level did not. So should we use consciousness for both of those levels? Now, because I'm a pastor, I pay attention to language. Ever since the 70s, I've heard consciousness raising. Oh, we're going to go out and we're going to raise the consciousness of a nation. Well, that's not exactly consciousness like my dog. And it's not exactly consciousness like my uncle or P.S., this lady that had a stroke. And, and usually it, had, it was at a lot of radical politics. And, and, and so then I did, looked at the definition of that and it said... Um, an activity of seeking to make people more aware. And again, it's like, well, we're getting really fudgy with this language. To, get, to make people more aware, but that's not really what they're thinking about with consciousness raising, is it? They want to change their behavior in some significant way that the behavior of a nation changes. So, so consciousness raisers were expecting a new consciousness in a body. Not just the individual human beings. They expected things... I'm going to move this. My eyes aren't getting younger. They expected things like social action, political transformation, but it was all implicit in the language. And all of this was in a very secular age. Now, I also did notice... Whoops. Oops, there we go. I also did notice, I, I, I found this course on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And in one of the slides, it had higher states of consciousness. And I thought, well, sometimes we look at consciousness like, is he conscious? sort of a binary, on, off. But, but then we have, like, higher states of consciousness. Like, is he really awake? No, I don't think that's what they're talking about. But it's sort of connected with that consciousness-raising thing. So this is the kind of thing when people say it and everybody nods and they say, oh, yeah. And nobody wants to say, oh, what? I, I don't understand. And 
because you don't want to look uncool or stupid or unspiritual. But, but really, again, here, what body are we thinking of? And, and it's not just the ones wrapped in skin. Now, now I feel a little bad for Rene Descartes because he kind of gets a hard time in this little corner of the internet. He's blamed for splitting the world and all of those things. And, and so I even have hand signals for Rene because those of you who watch my videos know that, you know, that we have this split world of substances and we have the lower register which is matter, flesh, earth, and with the upper register, which is mind, spirit, heaven. And, and I think actually, you know, a lot of the relevance realization, just like the highest levels of reality, are right there between them. And, and we just keep struggling to understand the relationship between these things. Now, a lot of reductive materialism sees the upper register as dependent upon the lower, that well, we, we, we evolve and we evolve and we evolve and then we're conscious. And matter is primary and mind is secondary. And this is, I think, part of the reason for the rise of panpsychism. And I'm not a panpsychist either, but it really caught my attention when Rupert Sheldrake said, is the sun conscious? Because it's like, wow. Is, you know, consciousness is, emerges from electrical connections and, and, I mean, anybody figure out which of those little balls is Earth? It's none of the big ones. And, and these little balls that are on top of our heads are far smaller still. And, and so, is the sun conscious? It certainly has fast, complex electrical network and and if we assume that conscious is sort of an emergent property, well, but then the real interesting questions come, how would we test if the sun is conscious? And would it matter to us? And the really frightening question is, would we matter to it? Now, we usually judge consciousness, and this is where you know, I, I felt a little bit more comfortable when John was talking instead of thinking, Burke, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wing it, Burke, I'm going to wing it. We usually judge consciousness as being the ability to respond intelligently to a change somewhere in an environment. And, it, and in fact, doesn't even have to be a physical environment because not a lot changed in this room when I was sitting back there taking real notes at John's lecture thinking, oh boy, what am I, what am I, how am I going to follow this up? Something changed, I was conscious, and I, I tracked it. And intelligently usually has, with a purpose, pursuing a preferred outcome. I, I wanted to stand up here and have a good talk and get it in within my timeline, because, you know, I can't go for two hours. And, and, and I wanted to not look like, you know, I wanted to at least hold up the, the church and say, well, you know, that maybe a pastor has something to say. An experience of awareness is just as elusive because we struggle to understand even an animal's experience of consciousness or even awareness. And, and this is where, you know, John's lecture was very interesting because, and I'm not pinning this on John, but it seems like the conversation has drifted way up into and way narrow into sort of human consciousness, and that immediately makes me think of Ian McGilchrist, because in many ways, that's the scientific effort. We have to define it and get it and narrow it. But as a pastor, people don't work that way. People work on the question, does Google read your email? And so we have this really funny question, do plants have consciousness? And I, I remember again in the 70s, a lot of fun things happened in the 70s, you know. Everybody was talking to their plants and, and then people were like, well, it's the, it's the CO2. And I thought, eh, it's not that much CO2 when we're talking to our plant. And, and of course, you know, we had ideas about people who did talk to their plants, but we're not gonna talk about that. But then you have this question about mechanism and mechanistic. And I was watching a car video the other day because I like watching car videos too. And um, um, 
Marquise was walking around a Rivian truck and the, you know, the truck has an issue that it's not quite sure how far or close the cell phone should be and so it keeps locking itself. And I was thinking, now I can sort of understand why the definitions are going up with respect to consciousness because so many things we're doing now. Does your car know you're close and it unlocks the door? Does Google read your emails? And, and I think this is, again, part of a meaning crisis. And of course, I wanted to bring in the Bible, so I said, the meaning crisis crouches at your door and it's looking to consume you. Some of you will know where that's from. And, and then one of the most interesting conversations I found recently, John said, well, you can't bring in a YouTube video. I said, oh, watch me. In fact, I'm going to clean it up because actually if you try to transcribe spoken text, it's a little messy. So Jordan Peterson is talking to um, Richard Dawkins. And most of the conversation was kind of difficult. But there's a little moment in the conversation that, in fact, really caught my eye. I made a little video of it. But then when I went to Germany, I think three people brought this moment of the video up to me. I believe intelligence is something that comes late into the universe, Richard Dawkins said. Do you distinguish between intelligence and consciousness, Jordan asked. And right away I thought of John because, you know, if you think about consciousness and you think about this really amazing idea of relevance realization and just how, um, how, how powerful that idea is and how it is, it, it can really connect into a lot of things. Yeah, intelligence and consciousness. And that was very much, I mean, John was really hitting on that in terms of this academic conversation about consciousness. And, and Richard Dawkins says, for this purpose, no. That's, that's a real academic move. For this purpose, do you think sexual selection is mediated by consciousness slash intelligence? Ooh. See, as a pastor, too, you read all kinds of other books like marriage books and all these theories. I remember one theory was people choose a spouse based on the unresolved issues they had with a parent. Hmm. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, I sure didn't. Others are thinking, oh, I sure did. It's not conscious. Is it intelligent? Yeah. But it, it, it sets us in an entire universe of what is an unresolved issue? What, how, in fact, would we know an unresolved issue when we don't even know what our issues are and we'd have to sit in front of a therapist and work for weeks, months, years just finding the issues only to realize, I married someone to resolve the unresolved issues with my mother. Hmm. In those species that have consciousness, Richard Dawkins says, yes. Hmm. Well, intelligence, consciousness, late. Jordan, to what degree does consciousness operate as a, fund, as a fundamental of selection and shaping? Oh, like, I don't know, all these animals that are have all these complex schemes and mating behaviors and, and, and they're, they're just all over the place. And are animals conscious? I, I tend to think they are. Social selection happens in insects which I do not think are conscious. And then I thought, well, are insects conscious? That's a tough one because you have the cat, the dog, the bunny, the gerbil, the hamster, all these mammals that we like to have in the house, the insect. Well, the fly, when I start chasing around, sure is running away from me intelligently. They're not real intelligent, but smart enough to evade me a lot. Jordan, that's a tough one because I know butterflies can detect a deviation in symmetry in their partners at one in a million. Wow. And... I, I don't know, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what John has to say about something like that because the question then is, is a butterfly doing relevance realization? 
seems to me the deviation in symmetry is relevant to the butterfly. And it seems to be doing it. So is it conscious? And Jordan has a real zinger here. When I look at religious epistemology cross-culturally, I see a bipartite structure at the bottom of, hypothesi uh, of the hypothesizer. There's an idea of a material substrate as a latent potential, and there's the action of forming process on top of that. It looks to me like it's something like an intuitive apprehension of the relationship between consciousness and the rise to complexity in living forms. Now that's a little difficult to sort of get your mind around, but it's sort of like this. And he's saying that religions almost all across the board think that there is something coming down to form the world. The reason that I'm curious about that from an evolutionary perspective is that I can't see how Forget about unconscious sexual selection for a minute, and I'm thinking, what would unconscious sexual selection be? But put that over to the side for a minute. Maybe there are gradations of consciousness. Our language certainly seems to think so. And then he says, insects do some damn complex things. They do. Uh, Colin Wright, I had a conversation with me uh, he lives near Sacramento. He got in trouble with all the woke stuff. And I talked to him about what he was studying. He was studying social spiders. And I thought, that's terrifying. <laughs> if spiders can be social, maybe they'll stalk us. But... And then he says, have you seen that BBC clip of the puffer fish making a sculpture? And, and, and so the little puffer fish, he's, he's, he's there making that sculpture and What's on that puffer fish's mind? And I, I don't really know, but I don't really think a puffer fish has a lot going on in his mind. But is the puffer fish conscious when it makes this elaborate sculpture? Now, it might probably not be conscious in the way that if, if someone said, go down and make a puffer fish sculpture with your hands, Vander Clay, and I'd be like having my phone here and I'd be going like this. There'd be a lot of stuff going on that I'm sure the puffer fish is not doing at all. But you see this in all kinds of crazy things. And, and it almost seemed to me like it was analogous to the woman saying, I want to live in this house. Why? Well, I don't know. I just want to live in this house. Is there a reason? Yeah, there is a reason. This house isn't on fire lady doesn't know that. Is this conscious? Back to Jordan. I don't think it's completely out of the realm of question that there's a spirit that gives rise to physical order, is metaphysical reflection of the idea that consciousness shapes biology, biological being through sexual selection. And here's the crazy thing that Dawkins says. But that spirit would have had to been around before evolution got started. <laughs> and Jordan says, well, yeah, that's a big problem. And Eric Weinstein wasn't in the conversation, but I immediately thought of something that I heard Eric say in a Discord room once. The problem with God is that you don't know what he's thinking. And it's sort of like, is Google reading my email? And it's sort of like the sun. Now, someone, not really a thing, Lewis, C.S. Lewis imagines, has been making for us a kind of life that we all assume. Change, agency, um, intentionality, pursuit of the good, the true and the beautiful from the beginning. We are not prisoners of the whole show. And, and in many ways, Lewis's reason in miracles, I think, actually bears a lot of relationship in some ways to John's relevance realization in his book. Now I want to talk about spirits because after Descartes, after a certain number of years of the Enlightenment, everybody got real publicly skeptical about spirits, but privately not so much. And so part of what I've been doing on my channel is, is trying to talk about this word. And so I found some ideas of spirits that almost no one would 
debate, because it's still in our language, school spirit. And I ask, what in fact is that school spirit that your school has? And, and we seem to generate spirits. Do they pre-exist? Are archetypes in some ways really spirits? So school spirit, it's, it's a collective participatory spirit that, that we are in some ways and aren't conscious of. When you go to the pep rally, something moves you. And, and something happens, and, and everyone will say, yeah, there's such a thing as school spirit. And it's generated by the culture of the town. You have principals, teachers, students, athletes, cheerleaders, nerds, potheads. And, and they all participate and are subject to it, moving with it or pushing against it. And nobody can really change it, but it's certainly there. And it's certainly shaping the school, the flyers on the wall, the uniforms on the students, all over the place. School spirit is a very real spirit, and we all use the language. And there is, in fact, a student body that is moved by school spirit. But is it conscious? How would we know? Boy, now we're really, no, 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 no it can't, can't be conscious. But once you begin to see spirits in this manner, you begin to recognize a whole bunch of things. There's a spirit of your marriage. There's a spirit of your meeting. There's a spirit of this conference, which you're all participating in and generating and also being subject to, and it's changing your behavior. And, and there's a spirit of a nation, and there's actually too many to count, and they're all intertwined. They're sort of like the wheat and the tares. And spirits that begin with us but go way beyond us and they outlive us through what we create and, and through each other. The books, the art, even just the memories of our children and grandchildren. And, and we have to ask, well, how did this whole thing get going? The whole premise behind evolution and biology and psychology is that selection based on gradients of consciousness, have been shaping things for a very long time. And to pull a word I learned from John, these are all transjective qualities that seem to rise up. And now to borrow a little bit from Jonathan, we also have these spiritual bodies. And, and that's the word we use. We have congressional body, and we even say corporate body, and we don't stop and say, now wait a minute, we've said the same word twice, almost. And, and there's a civic body, and there's a church body, and it's all still in our language, because spirits energize all of these things, and the spirits are changed by them, and they are changed by the spirits. But are these bodies conscious? How would we know? It's, it's kind of sort of like the sun. Now, if we're doing an estuary group, and um, if there's time here and some people want to pull me aside and say, let me just, just run through the estuary thing with me. What's really interesting about the estuary pro pro protocol, like, like I call it, is it's a way to sort of democratically source a conversation. And, and as you're going through the protocol, what you begin to realize is that the group together is creating something. And you all sort of know what it is, and you all sort of can violate it, and, and, but that something changes as you change it, and it changes you, and it's, it's very back and forth. There's a spirit of the meeting and a spirit of the group, and the body possesses a consciousness that you participate in but can't fully control or even articulate. Can we use that word for this kind of body? We do all the time. We would use it in our language, are we right to? And then there's a question of awareness, and, and Jonathan has made some interesting comments about a city, how a city has a spirit. And, and the city, in fact, responds as an agentic body to factors impacting it not unlike you and your body. The woman points out the house. And I've often talked about my consciousness congress, just, just like we have individuals, but in some ways, a city sort of has a consciousness congress. But the consciousness isn't anything like we experience awareness, but yet the city responds if I don't take out my garbage can. And 
you know, big things in the news like George Floyd. Who would say that that didn't impact the consciousness of a city? Is, you know, do we need new words? Is that the right word? It's a different experience of consciousness, but we accept sort of similar consciousness, sort of a lack of awareness consciousness in terms of stroke victims and animals. Now, John and I had one of my favorite conversations with John was he was tremendously gracious to basically let me run through an argument. And I was talking about God number one and God number two, and I'll get to that. The most reasonable way to relate to agentic conscious bodies above and beyond human beings is, I would say, the spirit of finesse. I think the spirit of geometry is very connected to what Ian McGiltris calls the left brain, where it's, it's something that we, we, we narrow down and we define and we, we try and get it into as small a thing and as tight a thing and as clear a thing as we can. And that's a powerful thing. But the spirit of finesse is how we relate to other people. We listen. We go back and forth. We're sensitive. We watch them. We relate to a corporate body because we assume consciousness. Now, you approach conscious spiritual bodies above you with a spirit of finesse. And every mayor is smart to do that because if the consciousness of the city changes, the mayor may lose his job. Or even worse in some countries. Now, our language and practice assumes agency and consciousness. People are demanding change. Oh, who, the people? They're a spiritual body. Demanding, do they, do they have a consciousness that is sort of welling up this demand? And this is simply how we live at the highest possible political levels, and we're not terribly aware of it. Let me skip a couple. The book of Isaiah says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, conscience is sort of a dead reckoning of moral navigation. And the God number one is the arenic God, and the God number two is the agentic God. And Israel has violated a relationship and has suffered for it, but now someone is acting on her behalf to restore her. And, and, and there's, a, there's a dance that goes on in this. And then now notice how remarkably disciplined the Bible is on this topic. Because the Bible... It feels, in fact, almost secular. Israel and Christians are told not to pray to the sun, moon, and stars. Although the psalmist will address them. Genesis 1 sees these as functionaries under a collective sovereignty of an arenic and agentic God. God number one is God as arena. Hebrew revolutionary monotheism Contra the metadivine realm. Feels almost non-theistic or classical theistic. God is not a thing. But then God number two as an, as, an, as an agent. When you're in a vital, deliberative body, what are you told to do? Address the chair. What is the chair? Isn't the chair the center of consciousness of that group? Yahweh is the king of the heavenly host. Everybody wants me to bring in Michael Heiser. Well, here you go, his divine counsel. Same thing. The Son of God comes to form a body with us and restore the kingdom. Does that body have consciousness? It seems to be the word we use. Now, the formation of this body is a historical fact. And I think Tom Holland's book is one of the best books on that. And this historical fact of the spirit of Christ has, I think if you read Tom's book, significantly changed the course 
of the world. In fact, all of our individual consciousnesses are so transformed by the reality of this one man and one event 2,000 years ago, it's almost unthinkable that we'd use any other word to describe it. Now, now you got to be a little careful with your Cartesian dualistic imagination when you talk about the spirit of Christ because in a strange way, something happened that unleashed a spirit that has been working through all sorts of things for 2,000 years to make elements of our society completely normal for us, whether or not whatever we believe about this man. Even the question, does Google read my email? Does the body of Christ have consciousness? Yeah, you might say, yeah, you told us the word was fudgy, and then you fudged it up even more, Vander Clay. But if so, how would you participate? Do you see it? Or do you know it and act in a different way, even if you're unsure? And just to remind you that I am a preacher, what if, in fact, the stories are true? What if the arenic God became flesh and demonstrated his power and love, not by killing his enemies, but by dying for them? And that act unleashed a spirit which has continued to sort of penetrate our consciousness in so many different ways. Tom Holland, when I met him, he said, well, that would be the greatest story ever told and has continued to be the basis for all of these other stories. What if he demonstrated who he was by his mastery of the arena we see? And what if we are the sticking point in the renewal of all things? You see, then, What real life actions would you have to take in life to no longer be a sleepwalker? To no longer say, well, obviously this house. Well, how do you know? Well, maybe I'd make up a reason. Is that consciousness? I don't know. That's my question. <laughs>